West of Casino, the Gustav Line followed the Rapido to the Garriano River and on to the coast. Near the sea, where the mountains were less imposing, the British had managed to cross the river near the town of Minterno. For the remainder of the campaign to capture Rome, second chemical operations would be in this area. In 1944, in March, D Company was sent to the Minterno area to support the 88th Division, and the primary purpose was to assist the 88th Division to learn how to use their mortars and artillery in, in spot support. They had trained with mass artillery fire to soften up areas for large assaults. Whereas what Second Chemical had become expert at was supporting patrols and small actions by hitting point targets as small as a single vehicle or house called in by observers. The little apple orchard behind me sits at map coordinates 782964. On March 21st of 1944, an observer from the 88th Division called in a fire mission against 12 Germans who were in a house at this location. In this citrus grove and next to it are a, a very old outbuilding and piles of rubble and a house on the road which is a mix of old construction and new construction. I just spoke with an elderly lady who was here during the war and she told me that this house was indeed occupied by the Germans. It was shelled and partially destroyed and later was used by the Americans as an infirmary. La casa qui in... È tutto qui, questa casa è qua. Ci stavano gli tedeschi. Ah, tedeschi? Eh. Qui? In la casa? Uh, las bombas. Eh, las bombas, Qui. la rotta. Poi l'hanno rifatta. Sì. Incredibile. E qua ci stanno tutti americani, tutti morti. Tutti americani morti. She showed me the spot outside her fence where the bodies of dead American soldiers were laid out side by side as the assault moved northward toward Rome. Minterno lies on a hill that looks over the Garriano Plain. Looking out over that plain, we can see where D Company's guns in March were set up on the southern edge of town. In May, when the entire battalion arrived, they were spread out to the west. On May 11, 1944, at 11 p.m., the Allies launched Operation Diadem to break the Gustav Line. Most men said it was the largest artillery barrage that they saw during the war. With 49 guns, Second Chemical fired 1,940 shells in the first 15 minutes, as much as six battalions of 105 millimeter howitzers. The town of Santa Maria Infante lies a few miles north of Minterno. It was completely destroyed. Many men told me that the advance up the road to Santa Maria Infante was the most gruesome, haunting experience of their lives. Francis Pender had nightmares about it for more than 50 years. Today we are visiting a place called Santa Maria Alfante. So you can give some commentary where the place if you want. Okay, well this is the valley north of Santa Maria Infante. And after Santa Maria Infante was taken, the Germans fell back across this valley into the mountains on the other side. And in fact, within a month, had fallen back all the way to Rome. And CC is both on the left and the right-hand side of this panorama. <laughs> yes, well, taking a picture of the uh, documentation on the wall here in World War II in 1943-44. Some local Italian on a Sunday morning. Uh, 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 American? Uh, uh, comment? Uh, you have the Mr. Oh, oh, uh, where, where did you live? Oh, okay. Haha, uh, okay. I'm from Louisiana, and my friend here is from Singapore. Where are you from? Uh, Canada. I, I was born here, but I'm, I live in Canada. In Canada. Oh, okay, good. I'm here as a tourist. tourist? Good. We so are we. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I came 
this way because uh, my father was in the war here. And, uh, yes, he was at casino and. Uh, okay, turn on. He started at uh, Salerno, Benevento, all had the same photograph as shown on the statue around here. The people in Santa Maria were very pleased that we had come specifically to see their town and were not just passing through. They were even more pleased when it turned out that I had some of the photographs that they had on their monument in the piazza, and even more pleased to see the same pictures and the dimension of their town in my book. The result was I got my picture taken with the mayor, and Cece and I were invited to 12-course Italian Sunday lunch, beginning with pasta and ending with limoncello and tiramisu. <laughs> Goodbye time. <laughs> Bye bye. 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 Bye Two ladies present, the matriarchs of the family, showed me terrible scar tissue from wounds on their arms. One had been standing with her husband when a bomb killed him. The other, 15 years old, following her father on a trail to evacuate the village when her father stepped on a mine which killed him and wounded her. In mid-May, the Germans fell back from Santa Maria and Fonte northwards toward Rome. A Company drew the card of going cross-country with the 351st Infantry Regiment through the Arunzi Mountains to cut Highway 82, which joined Highway 6 and 7. This was a trackless wilderness, few roads, fewer towns, and many vertical rocky surfaces. The mortars and a few hundred shells were packed on mules. This was not an easy trick because the mortar base plates and barrels are very heavy and unstable and it's easy to pack it in such a way that it slides off the mule or overbalances him and they lost a lot of mules on steep slopes. A Company may not have known but the 351st Infantry was famous for its hiking ability. It had received a commendation from George C. Marshall himself for a non-stop hike of 70 miles without a single man falling out. The town of Linola sits astride one of the few roads through these mountains. In this case, a road that connects Highway 6 with Highway 82. The only Americans that might have used that road were the 351st Infantry and A Company of 2nd Chemical. They were coming through the mountains for the express purpose of making sure the Germans didn't use it. But it was here that the Germans set up their defensive point to make sure that no larger American units used the mountain passes. It's a good defensive position. There's a little flat valley in front of it and steep slopes coming down from the other side. But the Germans had no real support all of their main strength was falling back on either side and when they were hit with the full firepower of a U.S. infantry regiment supported by a company of 4.2 chemical mortars it was a short fight and then the way was open for the Americans to proceed. The last stop on our trip is here the last stop for 7,861 Americans. 
18 of whom were killed serving with the 2nd Chemical Mortar Battalion. Another 3,095 were commemorated, but their bodies were never recovered. Attack 5, William McNay died October 29, 1943. My father was standing next to him when he died. He was hit by an airburst, and my father said a fragment may have made a tiny hole in his neck no bigger than a pencil point, and yet it paralyzed him and he couldn't breathe and he died in a few minutes. Private Irvin Covan, Private Johnny Coyne, and Private Frank DiCenzo were all killed by artillery September 11, 1943, the day of the German counterattack that almost drove through to the water at the Salerno beachhead. Howard Brooks lies here from C Company. He and Luther Hacker and Richard Brooks were scheduled to go to Naples for arrest December the 20th, 1943. John Solon was telling them about good places to eat in Naples when a German air raid came in and killed the three of them in their bunker. John had run the other way and the others ran into the bunker and John had to dig out their bodies. Private Paul Picard February 10th, 1944, he took a message to the headquarters of the 143rd Infantry, was standing in the door of a stone house when a shell hit nearby and killed him. On February 6, 1944, Tech 5 Joe Farley was riding in a Jeep with Captain Doug McConaughey. Shell fire came in on the road as they traveled and they bailed out of the Jeep, and a few minutes later, a shell killed Farley. The others in the group were unhurt. Sergeant Benjamin Harner, Private John Mazarek, and Private Cecil Five Ash were all killed at the foot of Monte Rotondo on November 11, 1943. Private Marvin Gray and Private Leonard Sanabed, as killed in that same mine explosion, were removed and buried at the request of their families in the United States. Private Joe Brusilleri was the first man killed in D Company. August 16, 1943, Joe heard the shell as it came in and he ran for cover in a culvert under a road where he should have been perfectly safe, but the shell hit exactly at the end of the culvert. Art Hall recalled Joe as a nice guy and remembered that the next day people showed him where the shell struck at the mouth of the culvert. This is where Archie Pugh is buried. He died near Fragnito Monforte, October 10th, 1943. And my father has several pictures of him that were taken just before he was killed. I've never been able to locate his family. I know that he was entered in the registry of deceased veterans by his sister-in-law, Mrs. Mabel Pugh. And they tell me here that he was from Decatur, Georgia. Before that, I only knew that he was from somewhere in the Atlanta area. In this hall are inscribed the names of 3,075 Americans whose bodies were never recovered. As I look over the walls and all those names, I remember that my father wrote that in war, it's not long before you realize that the body doesn't matter much anymore after the person is gone. He said none of those people or these people know or care where or whether they're buried after they're gone. And that's a reminder that this place and the expense that the U.S. government goes to to keep it well maintained, not really for the people who are buried here, it's for us.